my interpretation of the intermediate state, what happens to a Christian between death and resurrection, has never been influenced by neuroscience. I'll just say that first. Um, it began to be shaped during my undergraduate studies in a Bachelor of Theology program at Jamaica Theological Seminary. Early in my theological studies, I came to realize that the core hope of New Testament eschatology is that at Christ's return, God will raise the faithful to new life and redeem the cosmos, resulting in a new creation. So the realization that resurrection and new creation, you know what happened there? Oh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the realization of resurrection and new creation, not heaven hereafter, is the core biblical hope, has only deepened from my early theological studies through my years as a campus minister, as I did graduate studies in philosophy with an MA thesis on religious language in Aquinas and Tillich, then biblical studies with a doctorate on humans created as image of God, and it's further deepened through many years of teaching the Bible to laity in the church, to college students, and to seminary students. Also, during my early theological studies, I came to understand that the Bible does not have a bifurcated view of the human person, often called soul and body or spirit and body, such that the soul or the spirit is an immortal part of the person, often identified with the essential person. I don't deny the book that was just referred to. There are always outliers in any theory, uh, but it's not the dominant view by any means. So categories like um, soul or spirit in opposition to body or materiality may not be defined today in Platonic ways, but to think of them as an immortal part of the person that is the essential person that survives death is an inheritance from the history of theology and philosophy, which does not immediately invalidate them, because I don't believe in the genetic fallacy. My issue is that the Bible has a, what I'd call a unified, though multidimensional and non-reductive view of the person as an integrated embodied whole. I don't think it has a theory of the person, but it has an understanding of the person. And scripture further understands human beings as having been created mortal, with the ability to attain immortality, something we lost in the fall, so that for us, after the fall, immortality is a future hope, which takes the form of the resurrection of the body, as Paul makes very clear in 1 Corinthians 15. And this unified, essentially embodied understanding of the human person has impacted my view of the possibility of the so-called intermediate state, which often envisions a disembodied soul or spirit going to be with Christ in heaven, as we await resurrection. Let me see if I get this working now, because I got a nice slide for, in the, for the next piece. So is that gonna show? Yeah, all right. If I had time, I'd go into an exposition of the early chapters of Genesis, which portray the creation of human beings. And these texts are paradigmatic and canonical for our understanding of what it means to be human. Um, so I could address the issue of how we tend to read later theological ideas into biblical terms like soul, Hebrew nefesh, in the early chapters of Genesis, a term, by the way, that's applied equally to animals and human beings. Both are created nefesh chaya, living souls. And to say a soul is living is not redundant because in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, nefesh refers to a corpse in some times. The semantic range of nefesh can refer to the person, praise the Lord, oh my soul, that's personal, can refer to a dead body, can refer to normally a living organism, so that when the waters come up to my neck, the seaweed has covered my nefesh. That's where I breathe from. And Greek suche and the adjective sukikos in Paul always has a negative term. It refers to human beings under the auspices of sin to be transformed by spirit, which is not in Paul or in the Old Testament, related to immateriality in any way. So whether we discuss an immaterial part of the person, let's not connect it to biblical language, which doesn't mean that. Let's discuss that on other grounds. Terms like suke, soul, nefesh, ruach, and so forth, have their own integral revelatory meaning, which ought to have priority over our modern or medieval categories. As Inigo Montoya would say to Vicini, and the Princess Bride, you keep using that word, I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and if you're disappointed that I won't be advocating an immortal soul as what guarantees personal identity between death and resurrection, then as the man in black says to Inigo, also in the Princess Bride, 
get used to disappointment. <laughs> now, if I had time, I would track various portrayals of this integrated, essentially embodied nature of the person throughout Old and New Testaments, but I don't have time to do that. But that's my goal with, with students. I try to show them the biblical theology of the text as it spans Old and New Testaments to show what God's purposes are for the renewal of life in this world, that we may live out the Missio Dei, the mission of God in embodied ways in the world, a world that is broken and in need. Because of time constraints, I'm going to focus simply on two New Testament texts that seem to suggest that believers go to heaven immediately at death. And I admit at the outset that these texts and this idea is dear to many Christians throughout the ages. Indeed, I'm actually loath to address the, the topic of the intermediate state, because I don't typically take it upon myself to disabuse my students of their belief in that. I simply teach the distinctive Christian hope of God's intent to renew the world and raise us to new life in a new, new creation. And the idea of the intermediate state tends to pale into insignificance by comparison. But you asked me to address this topic, so I'll take up the challenge. When I began researching the topic a few years ago for my book, A New Heaven and a New Earth, for an, a short excursus in that book, I was ready to concede that there might be some sporadic evidence in the Bible for such an intermediate state, even though it was clear that this was not the dominant Christian hope in Scripture. I was initially um, pre prepared to concur with C.S. Lewis when he stated in his book on miracles, the earliest Christian documents give a casual and unemphatic assent to the belief that the supernatural part of a man survives the death of the natural organism. But they're very little interested in this matter. What they're intensely interested in is the restoration or resurrection of the whole composite creature by a miraculous divine act. Now, admittedly, it's a decidedly unbiblical way of putting the matter, since there is no supernatural part of a person. We are natural creatures, dependent for our lives on the, on the will of God. But I was nevertheless glad to see that Lewis affirmed that the resurrection or the restoration of the person was the true focus of New Testament eschatology. Like Lewis, I assume that a few biblical texts might in fact portray an interim state for the righteous in advance of their final destiny of resurrection. Like Lewis, N.T. Wright, who's been referred to already, has affirmed the validity of an intermediate state, which he thinks, or let me clarify, which he used to think, because I've had conversations with Wright a year ago, uh, was accepted by most first century Jews and the New Testament. He called this at the time, life after death, which is why he coined the phrase life after, life after death for resurrection. The Wright's point was that while we may believe in life after death, an intermediate state, presumably in heaven, that's not the genuine Christian hope. And he, even back then when he started talking this language, affirmed that too much concern with the intermediate state can detract from a proper focus, which is that God intends to renew earthly life starting now, because this affects how we live in the world. However, my own study of the New Testament texts that purportedly teach or mention an intermediate state, there are only six of them, convinced me that none of them actually does. I can't deal with all the relevant texts here, for that, you'll have to go read the excursus in my book, New Heaven and New Earth. I'm going to focus on the two most important texts. The first is 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. More than any other New Testament text, this has been used as a basis for a blessed hope in heaven immediately after death. Even the literary context of these verses in 2 Corinthians seems to support what we might call an otherworldly orientation. In an extended discussion stretching from 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 5, 10, as a literary unit, Paul appears to contrast body and life in the present with a heavenly eternal future. And at the end of chapter 4, that's not me, right? <laughs> Unless there's something, a spirit in this body, I don't know. Um, at the end of chapter 4, Paul speaks of our outer nature wasting away while our inner nature is being renewed in, chapter, in verse 16. And he contrasts in verse 18 what is seen and transitory with what is unseen and eternal. So it makes perfect sense then that in chapter 5, Paul would say, so we're always confident, even though we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. 
Now, have I just got myself into a bit of a jam here? Because what does Paul clearly say? He seems to emphasize a non-earthly, non-embodied future with Christ. Doesn't he say he'd prefer to be at home with the Lord, presumably in heaven, than in his present body on earth? Doesn't this clearly teach the hope of heaven that begins immediately at death when we're separated from our bodies? No. First thing we should note is that Paul has already stated in the first four verses of chapter 5 that his actual hope is for what he calls a heavenly dwelling that God has prepared for him. That's a resurrection body. That's a non-controversial interpretation. All the commentators accept that. Speaking of the contrast between the present body and the resurrection body, Paul says, for we know that if this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed we've taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we're still in this tent, we groan under our burden, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he who's prepared us for this very thing is God, who's given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So using the metaphor of a body, the body as a house or dwelling, Paul, as a good Jew, says that he doesn't want to be naked or unclothed, that is, disembodied in the eschaton, but rather to be clothed with a new resurrection body, a building or dwelling prepared by God, hence not made with hands. While the resurrection is future, Pauline theology affirms that if we have died with Christ, we have been raised with him already. We participate in the resurrection. And part of the grounding for that is that Paul affirms that we already have, in some sense, the hope for building our dwelling in the heavens. We have that already. It is guaranteed, and it's being made or prepared by God. This language of what, something being prepared in heaven to be manifest on earth at the last day is part of a pervasive pattern in the New Testament that I have addressed in a subsection of my book, a New Heaven and New Earth. This is just a chart from the book. You may not be able to see it here. But among the things that the New Testament says are being prepared or reserved or kept for us in heaven to be revealed at the last day are a kingdom, an inheritance, or salvation, a hope, a dwelling or house equivalent to our new body, a place with many rooms, or citizenship, a homeland or country, and a city, even the New Jerusalem. But what is prepared for us does not mean we will go there to enjoy them. And N.T. Wright uses the example of a father telling a son that I've got a lot of presents for you for Christmas. They're up in the cupboard. When Christmas comes, you don't have to go in the cupboard and play with them. I'll bring them out and give them to you in the living room. So the preparation in heaven is a pattern that guarantees that the future is in God's hands, but it's going to be manifest on the last day revealed, unveiled. It's an apocalyptic pattern. So Paul's hope of the resurrection is clear from verses 1 to 4. Our new bodies are being prepared by none other than God himself. And yet Paul also says he prefers to be away from the present body and at home with the Lord, presumably in heaven. So could it be that Paul has contradictory hopes? Does Paul long for the resurrection while shunning a disembodied state, being naked or unclothed? but also prefer a disembodied state to the present life of the mortal body. Perhaps he has a hierarchy, the resurrected body, then a disembodied state in heaven, and then the present earthly body. But this way of reading Paul ignores what he said earlier in the previous chapter. And remember, chapter divisions are artificial constructs people put into the letters of Paul. It was originally a continuous letter. So near the end of chapter 4, Paul explains the basis of his hope, why he's not driven to despair in his tribulations and sufferings. And the reason Paul says he can faithfully live in the midst of suffering is that we know that the one who has raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Notice, there is no separation here of resurrection and being in the presence of God, with Christ. Not only does Paul look forward to the resurrection, but he conceives of being in a resurrected, embodied state in the Lord's presence. So being in the presence of the Lord in 414 is, if we read contextually, equivalent to being at home with the Lord in 5.8. There is no convincing reason 
to separate the latter statement from Paul's hope of resurrection, except that we are habituated to read the text that way, and we ignore the previous chapter. In context, Paul is not speaking about being with Christ immediately after death, rather he's looking to the second coming, at which time we will be raised and be with Christ in the new creation. So plain reading of this text in context suggests that being at home with the Lord is nothing other than Paul's expectation that we will dwell with Christ in the new creation. So it's not at all clear to me that this passage teaches an intermediate disembodied state as any part of Christian hope. Besides this text, the other text most often cited to support the intermediate state is Luke 23, 39 to 43. This is a account of Jesus' interaction with the criminal, typically called the thief, on the cross. When the criminal pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus answers, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Surely this teaches the intermediate state. But well, to understand what's going on here, we first have to address a common misunderstanding. It's the assumption that many readers have that the kingdom of verse 42 is equivalent to paradise in verse 43, and that both refer to the afterlife. However, neither the Gospels nor standard Jewish theology from the first century would ever interpret the kingdom of God as referring to heaven or the afterlife. The term speaks rather of God's restorative rule over the world, when Israel and the nations will be subject in obedience to the will of the divine king. So the kingdom that Jesus will come into is nothing under that other than his messianic rule, representing the creator, to establish his rule over the nations at his return. It does not refer to life after death at all. That's the kingdom of God. What about paradise? Perhaps Jesus is telling the criminal that he doesn't have to wait for the eschaton when God's rule is established on earth because he'll already be in paradise with him today in the sense that he'll go directly to heaven at death. Of course, this hinges on the question, and it's not a simple question, of whether today goes grammatically with, I tell you today, or with, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is actually evidence putting it with the former. But I'll just accept for the sake of argument, that it goes with the latter. That, but there's two complicating issues for interpreting this as meaning that the thief or the criminal will go to be with Jesus in heaven immediately after death. First of all, the Greek word parades, paradisos, paradise, is how the Septuagint translates the Hebrew word for garden, gan, in the Garden of Eden account in Genesis 2 to 3, 12 times as I, as I find it. And according to the end of Genesis 3, when humanity is expelled from the garden, from paradise in the Septuagint, and denied access to the tree of life, with the way guarded by cherubim with a flaming sword, the point is that we no longer have access to the possibility of immortality, eating of the tree of life. Now, various second temple Jewish traditions developed about the inaccessibility of paradise, that is the Garden of Eden, and the tree of life. These traditions centered around the idea that God took the garden or paradise up into heaven. First of all, we have to understand that in the Bible, heaven is not an immaterial realm. Heaven is a sky. It's a metaphor for the transcendence of God. So it's taken away from us, so we can't get there. In fact, some of the, the texts suggest that it was taken up specifically to the top of a high mountain, touching heaven or the sky. This assumes the ancient Jewish picture of the world, with the mountains as the extremities that function as the pillars of heaven holding up the sky. So at the extremities of the earth where no one can reach, high up in heaven, that's where the tree of life is now. We have no access to it. So this is a world picture with, with the Garden of Eden and the tree of life at the midpoint between earth and heaven. But what's the theological point? The theological point is that immortality is presently inaccessible, but will be revealed at the last day on earth. This makes sense of the fact that paradise in the Bible refers to the primal earthly state of blessedness that we forfeited and not on any exegetical grounds to a disembodied heaven. Put simply, the core idea of paradise in scripture is the earthly blessedness that the human race lost with the fall, which is being prepared for the righteous to be enjoyed in the eschaton on a renewed earth. So we could easily add paradise to that list of things that God is preparing for us in the future. And this fits well with the book of Revelation, where Jesus promises the church at Ephesus, 
to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of our God. And then in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation, as a new Jerusalem with the tree of life in it comes down out of heaven from God, we now have access to the tree of life and the gates are never closed. This is the fulfillment of that paradise which was inaccessible before, but it's an earthly restoration of paradise. So there might be an argument for understanding the temporary location of paradise in heaven as part of what God is preparing for the saints. But paradise is not simply equivalent to heaven. More to the point, paradise, not in Jewish literature or the New Testament, is an immaterial place, the way heaven is often thought of in Christian theology. Even Origen of Alexandria, who clearly himself was a Platonist and had a bit of a, a, a allergic reaction to living on earth eternally, he had to acknowledge that paradise refers to some place situated on the earth that the saints will inherit. But of course, through moral progress, you'll ascend from the earth to heaven. He had to add that part in there, but he, had, he acknowledged paradise is earthly. So beyond the issue of the earthly concrete character of paradise, there is another question of what it might mean that the criminal would be with Jesus today. Because Jesus' assurance that they'd both be in paradise immediately at death, if that's what today means, confuses matters considerably. It's difficult to harmonize with the New Testament's own reckoning that Jesus was not raised until the third day and did not ascend to heaven for some time after that. Given this complication, Luke 23, 42 might actually be used to support the notion that there is no consciousness in the, immediate, in the intermediate state, but that one moves subjectively simply from death to resurrection. Which might make sense of Paul's expectation in 2 Corinthians 5 of the immediate presence of Christ at death, but in a risen form. And there are other texts that it can fit that very well too. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I think that's about resurrection, not about an intermediate state. So perhaps Oscar Kuhlman is right about the intermediate state. We wait and the dead wait. Of course, the rhythm of time may be different for them than for the living, and in this way, the interim time may be shortened for them. Or as F.F. F. Bruce put it, the tension created by the postulated interval between death and resurrection might be relieved today if it were suggested that in the consciousness of the departed believer, there is no interval between dissolution and investiture, however long an interval might be measured by the calendar of earthbound human history. And of course, there are other texts that one could look at, and I haven't had time to do that. Maybe we can delve into some of them in our discussion time, but maybe we want to address the question of substance dualism, or perhaps more, most importantly, we want to think about the pastoral implications of these views. So much as I respect C.S. Lewis, I think he may have been wrong in his comment about the New Testament's casual and unemphatic assent to personal survival at death. An N.T. Wright, a contemporary scholar of whom I have the utmost regard and whom I regard as a personal friend, may have conceded too much in his claim that Second Temple Judaism and the New Testament typically assumes an intermediate state. You can find that sporadically in Second Temple Judaism, but it's not universal, and I don't see it in the New Testament. So having studied the relevant text, I am surprised at how little evidence there actually is for this idea in the New Testament which JP might say is really relevant to the question. I think it's somewhat relevant. It turns out that the Bible does not explicitly teach an intermediate state. In the end, I believe that it does not matter, but for a different reason. Authentic Christian hope does not depend on an intermediate state, and Christians do not need the notion of an immortal soul in order to guarantee personal continuity between present existence and future resurrection. The God who brought the universe into being, is the guarantor of the eschatological future. In the memorable words of 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, which became the refrain of a very famous hymn, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So I place my hope not in a theory about what happens after death, but in the God of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, who is able to raise the dead, and who has faithfully promised to renew heaven and earth. Whatever we think about the intermediate state, and I acknowledge that belief is dear to many Christians, scripture is clear that our genuine hope 
is not heaven as either a final destination or an intermediate state. Okay, Middleton, but maybe that's biblical, but will it preach? <laughs> well, I preached at my mother's funeral in 2010, my dad's funeral in 2012, most recently my mother-in-law's funeral this past September. I can testify that not only did I not appeal on those occasions to the idea of our dear beloved ones now being with Christ in heaven, I explicitly said this was not the authentic Christian hope. Instead, I focused on the hope of resurrection and new creation. Scripture, I was bold to proclaim, promises the redemption of the entire created order and understands human redemption as the restoration of full-bodied life in a new earth. This is nothing less than the coming to fruition of God's intent from the beginning, which even death cannot thwart. And when the funeral service this past September was over, two sisters of my mother-in-law, both my wife's aunts, both devout Christians, asked me if I'd preach the same message at their funerals when their time came, because they said it gave them hope. Thank you.